Welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast, where we bring Sunday home. Join us as we dive deeper into First Baptist's weekly sermons, discuss practical applications, and answer your questions. Hello and welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast. I'm Jordan Upton, and today we're going to have Dr. Alex Watkins back on our podcast. Alex is our Minister of Adult Discipleship and Missions here at First Baptist. Alex, welcome back. Hey, thanks, Jordan. It's an honor to be back on the podcast with you all. Um, I, I say this every time that I get to join you. This is so much fun. And then to to go and listen to what you and Pastor Jeff do each week, it's it's really incredible. So thank you for the invite to be back on the podcast this week, uh, but also thank you for what you do each week, uh, bringing, bringing more life to what we hear during our worship gatherings here at First Baptist. So thank you so much for doing that. Again, it's an honor to be with you today and looking forward to diving into our conversation. Absolutely. It's an honor having you. It's an honor doing this podcast. And it's really fun doing this podcast. So yeah, you're right on all counts. Uh, Hey, are you ready for VBS, Alex? Whether I am or not, it's going to be here. Uh, Yes, but in, in all reality, yes, I'm super excited about Vacation Bible School. It's coming up. Uh, it's coming up in July, July 14th through the 18th. Our kids are going to get to see um, the wilderness escape, and it, it's going to be a blast. Lauren and her team are working uh, endlessly and tirelessly to uh, get everything ready to go. Uh, they... She's putting in so much work and so much effort. And by the way, we have a phenomenal team at First Baptist uh, from Lauren, TJ, Ricky, David, and every Pastor Jeff and everybody else in between. Uh, what we are able to accomplish uh, through this team here is incredible. Um, but Lauren's doing a great job getting our people ready. And we are super excited about Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School is one of the greatest tools that we have in getting the gospel to young kids. It's an easy way for us to to integrate the good news of the gospel into their lives uh, for one week at a time uh, each summer. And so we're super pumped. We're excited. It's here. If you have not registered for VBS, I want to encourage you to do so today. FirstBaptistBG.org, right in the middle of the homepage, is a big graphic. Just click on the graphic, and you'll be able to register. It'll take you to the registration page. So I want to encourage you to do that. We're super pumped, super excited, uh, and we really hope that that so many kids will join us for Vacation Bible School. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I was looking at some of the stuff that they're going to be doing. They're it, so it's all wilderness themed. It's like, mm-hmm. like you said, they're going for like from the Exodus to Sinai sort of. So they're getting all these uh, uh, ideas in there, but they're going to be weaving textiles, churning butter, and uh, Lauren's even lined up that they're going to meet camel herders. So that's some some crazy stuff to be doing as a kid. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. It's a it's a long ways removed from the um, sugar cookies and um, uh, red juice that we used to get at Vacation Bible School growing up, Uh, the stuff that was full of nothing but sugar, probably red dye 40 or whatever it is now uh, that just sent you on a a crazy afternoon wild ride after you leave Vacation Bible School. But uh, Lauren, again, has so much planned for our kids. It it goes from 6 to 8.30 each night, and I promise you there's not going to be a down second not just a down minute, but a down second for those kids as they move throughout uh, Wilderness Escape. And our stage, from what I have heard, is going to be transformed. So when those kids come into the sanctuary and they look up there on that stage, they're going to see something very incredible. Um, I don't know if she is giving all the details out yet, uh, but trust me, you're just just come to see the stage uh, from what I hear. Uh, so it's going to be really great. Yeah, and again, that's Sunday, July 14th through Thursday, July 18th. You can go to firstbaptistbg.org. There's a big banner. You'll see it right away. Just click on it, and you can learn more about VBS and uh, register there. So, Alex, on Sunday, you were at the pulpit, and you preached from Acts 4, 23 through 31. The text for that is, When they were released, that is, John and Peter, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, 
Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? And the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Okay, so in that passage, the apostles quoted from Psalm 2. So that's when it's talking about why do the Gentiles rage, or translated differently, why do the nations rage? Yeah. So uh, you also quoted a couple of verses from the psalm, and then a little later in the psalm, it goes on to say, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay, so particularly there at the end of the psalm, it's, it's talking about a rod of iron and dashing you know, these people to pieces. It really sounds like a violent overthrow of the nations that are raging against God. Uh, but the apostles are not advocating for a violent overthrow. It, it seems like they're doing anything but be violent. Can you kind of explain what's, what's going on in Psalm 2 and why the apostles are bringing that up here? Yeah, so Psalm 2 is commonly referred to as a royal psalm uh, because the subject of it concerns the anointing and coronation of a Davidic king. Uh, we can see that in 2 Kings eleven twelve. 12. It, scholars have no general agreement on the historical context uh, of the psalm as the dates and range anywhere from the time of David to the Maccabees. But the language, the style, and the theology fit that early monarchic date. And so there's there's very little evidence of linking the psalm to an actual coronation of a Judean king, and we find very little support from the text in this. I'm giving you a lot of backstory, but we're going to get to get to your question. Some argue that the psalm is preferable to to read in light of Nathan's prophecy of God's covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7, 5 through 16. But what we what we really need to see in the psalm are, are four sections. So section one is the rebellious nations, verses one through three. Section two is God's rule in heaven, verses four through six. Section three is God's decree, what you were just talking about, verses seven through nine. And then the rule of the Messiah is section four, the rule of the Messiah on the earth, section four, verses 10 through 12. So the apostles, they are quoting one of the most quotable Psalms throughout the New Testament. Actually, Psalm 2 is one of the favorites of the apostles because it speaks to the scriptural confirmation of Jesus's messianic office and his expected return with authority and with power. At the end of, of Matthew 28, we said it as we end um, uh, as we ended the service this past Sunday. We say the Great Commission together, we, we repeat it over each other, and we say it out loud. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. So it gives this, this understanding, this scriptural confirmation of Jesus's messianic office and his expected return with the authority. Again, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And Psalm 2 provides so much hope within so the anointed king rules by God's appointment. That's Christ who rules by the father's appointment. The wise response of repentance is a victory for the Messiah and a token of the final victory over his enemies, the opponents of God's kingdom. What we need to see about Psalm 2 is the apostles were referring to it here. Jesus, the one in whom has been crucified and has been gloriously resurrected, is the fulfillment of Psalm 2. So 
He is born of David's lineage, Matthew 1, Luke 2. He has the right to David's throne, Luke 1. He is the Son of God, Matthew 3, Luke 9, Hebrews 1. And he will ultimately subdue all the enemies under his feet, 1 Corinthians 15, Hebrews chapter 2. Okay, now to answer the question, after all of the backstory, now to answer the question, what's going on? Why did they quote it here? Well, when we talk about the decree of the Lord, it determines his relationship to the king and to the nations. The Davidic king is by birth and by promise the son of God. It signifies his legal standing. So the rule of God's Messiah ultimately brings stability even sometimes if he has to use force. And, and the Lord's king has, has the power to smash all opposition to his rule. And his sovereignty may be expressed as an iron rule in which rebels are crushed by, by their fragile clay vessels, Jeremiah 19, 11. And this authority is derived from God in that the Lord breaks the spirit of the rulers, Psalm 76, 12. And again, the scepter here is a symbol of rule, discipline and judgment. It's a symbol, the scepter of a monarch. It symbolizes the authority granted by God to rule with great power over the nations. And what we see in Acts 4 is the, uh, as the apostles are recounting what the Lord has done. If this was one of the favorites of the apostles to quote, one of the favorite Psalms of the apostles to quote and to pray and to, to, to bring back to the attention of whom they're talking with. In this particular case, they're bringing it back to their own attention as this is a prayer to the sovereign Lord. They're, they're reminding themselves of what Christ or what God has done throughout the history and what he's going to do and the fulfillment of who Jesus is. And, and, you know, just as the chief priests conspired against the Lord and his anointed one, Jesus, they're recalling how the nations would conspire against the Lord and his anointed one throughout their history. The nation sought their own power. We know this. They sought their own power. They sought their own authority to live how they wanted and to do what they wanted to do. So it's no wonder that we see not only in this passage, but also in other passages, the fact that the Lord is incredibly forceful with his language and ultimately what he will do. And so often we must never forget that God will judge the nations. In our culture, judgment is one that is to be left at the door. But the Lord is very pointed in the fact that every person will stand before him one day and give an account for their life. They will be judged. And as believers, our great assurance is found in the fact that through Christ, we are we stand before God without blemish, presented as spotless before God. Those who are without Christ stand with blemish, and they're not presented as spotless before God. And ultimately, God will judge them. The apostles, they're not advocating for violence. No, they're actually advocating for the prince of peace to rule and to reign through Jesus. They are simply recalling what the Lord has said and what the Lord will do. And they are uh, praying something that is really that's foreign to us. They're praying for boldness in the midst of opposition. They're praying for boldness to go into the opposition, to proclaim the very thing that is causing the opposition to proclaim Christ, the Lord, and his anointed one. They're asking the Lord to give them boldness to proclaim Christ among all people. So that's a really long answer with a little bit, of, with a lot of context behind it. Um, and so they're advocating for priests, or peace. They're advocating for the prince of peace to, to rule and to reign not only over their lives, but over the lives of all people everywhere. Yeah, that was a great answer. You had a lot of context in there that really brings a lot out of, you know, just this couple of verses that, that they quote, but there's a lot there that they're, you know, bringing into this passage. Uh, and, and like you said, Psalm 2, you know, you can break it into several sections and really see a really big eschatological plan. And, you know, again, just a couple of verses, but in several different different sections, 
you know, you were talking about at the beginning is talking about the nations raging, mm-hmm. uh, the people's plotting in vain. So it's like, you know, that's happening right now. That That yeah. is, you know, happening. Um, he who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord will hold them in derision. Uh, you know, that's still, you know, kind of going on right now. But uh, then uh, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Well, you know, w- Messiah has come. Uh, he mm-hmm. will come again. But, yeah. um, you know, we kind of see that step happening. Um, but then it goes on. You're, you know, the Lord has said to me, you're my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So like that, it's almost like that's coming. Like that mm-hmm. hasn't happened yet. But these things are kind of going on in the apostles' heads where, um, like you said, like this isn't a call for violence. Like even this psalm isn't a call for violence. Correct. It's it's telling us what's going to happen. Like there is a judgment that's happening. In light of that judgment, we need to act. We don't need to, you know, like yes. you said, hunker down. Uh, yes. We should be obedient and be doing what we're supposed to be doing. And here the apostles have all this in mind. You know, they've got, you know, he who heaven he who sits in heaven laughs, the Lord holds them in derision. You know, they're they're aware that um there's a lot of opposition to them, you know, particularly in Jerusalem at this time. They mentioned Herod and they mentioned Pontius Pilate, you know, mm-hmm. uh, very, very unfriendly to the believers. Uh, like you said, the high, high priest, the Sadducees, very, very unfriendly to the believers. There are Pharisees that want them dead, too. You know, it's it's a very complicated time to live in, but um, they can just look to the psalm and have all of these uh, promises of what's to come and take confidence. Uh, that's that's awesome. Thank, no, thank you for giving all of that context. Okay, so moving to the end of the passage you quoted, Luke wrote that the place where the apostles were was shaken and all were filled with the Holy Spirit. But weren't they already filled with the Holy Spirit? What's going on here? Yeah, that's a a great question to ask and one that uh, if we're not careful, we would confuse. And so in the Old Testament, the, the, the shaking of a place was a sign of theophany, the manifestation of, of God in visible form. We can see that in Exodus 19. We can see that in Isaiah 6. One scholar writes, it, it would have been regarded as indicating a divine response to prayer. It was God's way of indicating that he was present there and that he was going to actually answer his prayer right then, right there. And so filled with the Holy Spirit, this isn't a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's just a fresh filling. They already have the Holy Spirit who dwells deep within. We can see that from from Acts 2. They already have it. This is just a a fresh filling. And, And this is another instance in Acts where filling does not describe the characteristic of a person, but a special anointing. G. Campbell Morgan one scholar, he believes that the, the new feeling was intended to prevent the development of, of incipient fear. And certainly when we experience God in a fresh way, one of the first things that we receive is, is courage. I mean, when, when the Lord fills us in a fresh way as he's, he so desires to do, we, we really do receive courage. And this is what happened in the lives of those people in Acts 4. They receive courage to pray for something as great as boldness. And in their boldness, they were trusting in the sovereignty of God. Again, like you had mentioned, Jordan, they talked about, you know, God had anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles, along with the nations, along with the, along with the peoples of Israel to do whatever God desired to have happen. Well, what did God desire to have happen? Well, the father turned his back to the son and he crushed the son to bring about salvation, both to the Jew and to the Gentile. And so they were trusting in the sovereignty of God. And as he orchestrated what he did through Christ, and now as he's orchestrating them to be the mouthpiece, to be the vehicle in which the gospel would go to the furthest places on the planet. And so this, this idea of the Holy spirit filling them, it wasn't a, a a fresh baptism into it. No, it was a fresh filling. And so we, we all really do in some form or fashion, want the Holy spirit to move in a fresh and new way in our lives. And I, I have to wonder if I was there in acts two and the Holy spirit descended and I've got a, 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 a flame of fire 
resting on top of my head. And then obviously that, that flame of fire goes away because that's just a symbol. I have to wonder that, that I would want another fresh move of God to come very quickly. And so this is, this is that. They're praying in this regard. And so we all want that fresh move of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and may we, by God's grace, be willing to pray for a fresh move of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's dwelling deep within. Uh, that's, that's, that's why he came. Jesus said it was better for him to go so that the helper could come and be with us always. And so why wouldn't we want to unleash the power of Almighty God through the Holy Spirit dwelling deep within and have a fresh filling of him for the glory of his name? I like that. So it's not like a qualitative difference of the Holy Spirit. It, you know, the, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon them, you know, before, like they're, they're moving in the Holy Spirit, but this is almost like a, a refilling of the cup. It's mm. almost like, yeah. it, could you almost compare it to like Moses, you know, going back up the mountain, coming back down and, you know, glowing again, you know, mm-hmm. glowing afresh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think those are very comparable. Um, again, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, you know, you're, you're filled and then the Holy Spirit goes away. It's just a, a, a freshness into it, asking the Holy Spirit to do something else, to, to show up, to be, that, to, to be that constant presence as he always is, but to really say, all right, here it is. This is, this is what has happened. And because of that, that prayer, they've been now given a task to go and do. Because of that prayer, they're, they're, they're willing to go and do something um, that they ultimately would end up, many of them would lose their lives for. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's not a Holy Spirit come again. It's a Holy Spirit, just give me a, a fresh thing to, to do for the glory of your name. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, and you, you mentioned martyrdom there. That's a, that's a very real possibility for, um, it was a reality for the mm. apostles in the first century believers, and it, it's still a possibility and a reality today. Yeah. Uh, and that takes us to our practical application question today. Uh, like I mentioned on Sunday, you talked about how we as Christians are not supposed to hunker down. We're, we're supposed to be obedient to God and do what he would want us to do, to follow out the Great Commission. Uh, so, first of all, let's define it, though. What does hunkering down look like, and h- how do we avoid that? Yeah, hunkering down um, is is a term that, that I like to use for um, when we decide that the gospel is just good enough for us. And what I mean by that is to hunger down as a Christian is to allow the gospel to essentially stop with you. Um. You're, you're, you're saying that you believe the gospel is good enough for you, but you don't want to share it with anybody else. The greatest news ever told, you, you just kind of want to keep to yourself. Hunkering down means, means you're, you're, you're not willing to go into hard places and, and deal, with, deal with people. Let's, let's, let's be real honest. When we get to the mission of God, the mission of God isn't about buildings. It's not about um, making sure that our political alliances succeed. It's not about, um, it, you know, storing up things here for us. It's not about storing up our treasure here so that we can be comfortable. The mission of God is a, has and forever will be about people. It's about people. And so if we hunker down and say, ah, the gospel is just good enough for me, well, really, do we understand what it means to be a a follower of the Lord Jesus. Another way to put it is to think in this regard. Imagine you have the cure to cancer. Not just, we're, we're going to lump all the cancers together. We're going to put them all together. Not just one type, but every cancer. Imagine you have that cure. You've run the test. You've run the trials. You've done the research. You've done all the work. You've got the cure. You're ready, but you choose not to share it with anyone. Cancer has affected a lot of people all over the world, still does. Many who are listening today have been affected by cancer in some way. 
what good will it do if we have the cure, if you have the cure, but you're not willing to share it with anybody else? Sure, you, you won't have cancer. Because if you do, ultimately you have the cure. You can, you can cure cancer within yourself. But once you die, the cure has gone. It stops with you. For us as believers, we have the cure. And the cure is the gospel. It's Jesus. We've been entrusted with it. We've been entrusted with the truth. And it's our mandate from Christ our King to now go and proclaim that good news. Why would we ever want it to stop with us? You know, I, I, I truly believe in all of my, with all of my heart, if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ did exactly what it, it was designed to do, there would be no more orphans. There would be no hungry, hungry people. There would be no starvation. And the hardest people on the planet to reach would be reached with the gospel of the Lord Jesus and Christ would reign as he will one day in the lives of every people all over the planet for the glory of his name. I, I truly believe that. And we have to know and we have to understand. And I, I hope people hear my heart. This building is not the church. This building cannot proclaim anything, nothing. We can. We have the hope. We, as the people of God, must leverage our lives for the glory of his name, to take his name to all people everywhere. We've got the cure for lostness, and it's the gospel. So we've been commanded to go. We've been commissioned to go, and we must, by God's grace, go. Our community needs Christ. Our state needs Christ. Our nation needs Christ. The world needs Christ. And we have the answer. We have Christ Jesus. And we are now commissioned, called, and sent to take this gospel to all people everywhere. That's so good, Alex. I love the focus that you have on the Great Commission. Uh, you, you, you've said it uh, as soon as you were hired, we're going to keep circling back to the Great Commission and keep our focus on that. And you've really kept us there, and that's good. You know, when you have that focus on uh, what you're supposed to be doing, it's easier to do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, and, and I don't know why. Well, I do know why because it's, it's, it's God's word. But something about the Great Commission gripped me from uh, an early age. And, I've always wondered why, why, if it's in the scripture, why we don't, why we're not willing to go and do it. If it is the, if Jesus is who he says he is, if he really is who he says he is, then why wouldn't we take him at his word? Why wouldn't we take him uh, as the king who has now commissioned us to go and live out? his glorious gospel. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a living out and a proclaiming our lives are, are representative of what we believe. And so why would I not want to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus if that's what he said to do? And so my heart here for us at first Baptist and, and my heart for every local church is we would Take Christ at his word and go and live out what he's designed us and commissioned us to do. And that's to enjoy him by knowing him. And that's to make him known by going to all people everywhere. And by God's grace, one day this commission will be fulfilled. And every, every people group on the planet will have heard and some will have believed. And we will be around the throne with all believers one day in glory declaring that song over and over and over again uh, holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come and what a beautiful day that will be but until that day we've got some work to do so let's go and do it let's go and do it let's we talk a lot about making an impact in the lives of people around us well let's go and make an impact and eternal impact in the lives of people around us. We talk about impacting our community. We're, goodness gracious, we're coming into a political season. 
where it's going to get crazy. Let's make an impact during this season for the glory of Jesus' name. Let's not be defined as Republican or Democrat. Let's be defined as the children of God who go and make Jesus' name known. And so, yeah, keeping the Great Commission at the forefront of who we are is it's my task, and it's what we all should desire to do is, is to live out our faith where, where, where faith and life intersect at the corner of 12th and Chestnut. That's what we want to do. We want to help people live out their faith and proclaim Christ as they're doing so each and every day. Amen. And like we talked about at the beginning, one really incredible way the First Baptist uh, carries out this mission is through VBS. Yes. If you're a parent like Alex or like me, you, you have kids and they can go to VBS. They have to be three years of age to go to VBS. Uh, but if you have a child that can go to VBS, we would highly encourage you, go to firstbaptistbg.org, look for the banner for VBS and click on that. We also have the link to it in the show notes, so you can also go there. Uh, and if you have if you have questions for us about VBS or if you have questions about uh, the Christian walk in general or something like that, you can also go to the show notes and find the link to email us there. Okay, Alex, can you pray us out for today? Yeah, I, I would be glad to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We pray that we've made much of Jesus. Lord, help us to see that even when people conspire against you and Christ, Lord, you call us to trust you. You call us to trust in your sovereignty, how you're working all things together for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. So may we trust in you. And then, Father, may we echo the prayer of those believers in Acts 4. Lord, give us boldness, not just for the sake of boldness, we can be bold about a lot of things. But Father, give us boldness to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus. Give us boldness to declare his, his glory. Give us boldness to, to teach and to, to tell people and to, to preach about the resurrection of Christ from the grave, conquering sin, defeating death, and Satan once for all. Lord, give us boldness to live out our faith. Give us, give us boldness to proclaim your name. Lord, again, we thank you. We thank you for what you're going to do at Vacation Bible School. We pray that many, many students, many children, even adults, Father, many people would come to saving faith in you because of Vacation Bible School. Lord, we pray that we would walk in step with you, trusting and following, following you each and every day. Father, we pray in the only name that we can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel and submit a question to the link in our show notes. For even more First Baptist content, visit firstbaptistbg.org. Our engineer is Elliot Beckley, and our editors are Chadwick Walden and Tejon Bumpus.